Welcome back to Fossil Ridge Games. Today I'm excited to continue and expand upon our Frost Haven series. In the first video, I walked you through basic attack actions and basic movement actions. This video is going to focus on all the different terrain types that you can encounter while playing this fantastic game. Finally, toward the end of the video, I'm going to walk you through probably one of the most difficult things in this game, and that's surviving, opening a door, and going into a new unexplored area. Next, I'm going to walk you through difficult terrain. On the board, I have three spaces set up with debris in them, and each of these spaces is going to consume an extra point of movement when you go into it. So as an example, if I take the banner spirit and I move it into a location with difficult terrain, it's going to consume two points of movement as opposed to the normal one. Now, something else that we have at the very start of the game, and this is going to be one of the initial items that you can get, and so I'm just going to put the winged shoes up on the screen. You're gonna notice there's a little icon on here. It's kind of hard to zoom in on, but it basically looks like a little arrow that's curved and it's pointing at one of the spaces. This is the jump icon. Jumping means that you can go over various types of terrain features and or enemies. So as an example, if I'm going to back this wolf up right here, if I wanted to jump over this space, I could use the winged shoes. And instead of then consuming two points of movement for this, I would just simply fly over the space so I could go one, two spaces. So by using the jump icon and the jump ability of the game, you can help minimize uh, some of these effects. In addition to that, what one of the typical rules is, is that you're not allowed to go through an enemy. But if you were to use these winged shoes, you could essentially jump over the enemy. Um, the only rule is you can't jump and land on something. So you can't jump and then land on an enemy or another player. But you could use this to actually maneuver around the battlefield quite well. So if you're new to this game, please check out the winged shoes. It's a piece of equipment you can get when you're outfitting your characters at the very beginning of the game. Next, we're going to talk about a new mechanic that appears in Frosthaven, and this is the concept of icy terrain. So I went ahead and put three icy terrain hexes up on the board so we can kind of simulate this. Basically, what's happening with icy terrain is that the character is sliding through the space. So once they start moving through it, they're unable to control their movement, and they move an additional space through it. So as an example, if I have the banner spear, and if I move into an icy terrain hex, it's going to immediately move me one hex in the same direction as I was moving. So as an example, my direction of movement is going to be this way. So my first movement point would enter me here. Then the icy terrain effect goes off and immediately then will move me to the next hex. Now that's something that is a essentially a free movement point, but you can't tell your character essentially where to go. So once they start sliding in a certain direction, they just keep sliding. Now, what's kind of strange about this is that if you're at, let's say, the end of a set of icy tiles, you'll keep sliding from one tile to the next to the next. So as an example, if I spend one movement point to enter this hex right here, it immediately triggers. And what happens is the banner spear is going to slide to the next hex, which immediately causes this one to trigger, and then this one to trigger, and this one to trigger. So essentially, these icy terrain features kind of add an extra layer of strategy to the game. And I would have to admit the few missions I played with them has radically changed my thinking of, of how the game works and the game mechanics. And it, it added like a lot of, a, actually just a lot of chaos when we were playing it. Um, it was kind of confusing the first time that we saw it. So just be sure to note that when you move into one of these spaces too, it will actually stop you at a wall. So obviously you can't slide through a wall. So if we were entered to this space, it would trigger, 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 and then I would stop because I'm ramming into a wall on this end. In addition to that, an enemy will also stop your movement. So if I were to take the banner spear and move into this spot right here, I wouldn't slide actually into the hound. The reason behind it is the hound would basically stop my movement. So we're gonna go back to the winged shoes real quick and then the, the jump icon. So if I wanted to, I could use the winged shoes. So I'd go ahead and just exhaust this. And then the banner spear could jump over the ice. If the banner spear jumps or flies over this ice patch, it does not trigger. It's only when a character moves across it. As a final comment on icy terrain, 
it's for every single figure in the game. It's not just for characters. As an example, a hound can actually slide across icy patches as well. So just understand it's not just for the characters, but that's monsters. It's any figure, once it starts sliding, it will slide across the ice. So that will be NPCs as well. If you're summoning, let's say, skeletons or some sort of ally to aid you in fighting, they will also slide across the ice. Next, we're going to talk about traps. Now, traps in the game are very similar to some of the other tiles that we've talked about. And what that basically means is that any figure, if they cross over this, some sort of effect is going to occur. Now, typically traps are just going to inflict damage. But in some of the missions, it maybe the trap damages you and then also stuns you. I'll go over all the different status effects a little bit later on in this video. So as an example right here, we have a trap. And I went ahead and just put it onto the board. And I also just went ahead and put the damage sort of on it. And the reason why you want to do that is that it makes it graphically really easy when you're playing the game to understand if you cross across this tile, you're going to suffer damage. Now, what's easy to forget if you're playing, let's say, Frosthaven or Gloomhaven, especially early on, if you just see this tile, you might just simply ignore it and you'll pass your character over it. And... So as an example, you will always want to be putting the damage icons actually on it. So as the banner spear moves, if I go one, two spaces, if I move onto it or through it, it's going to trigger the trap. In this case, the banner spear is going to suffer three points of damage. It's a little bit hard to see this marker right here. And then you're just going to take the trap off the table. And that just means that it's simply gone off. Now, the traps can affect any figures as well. So if the hound is going to be moving, it could potentially move through the trapped location. As I get into how enemies move a little bit later, there's gonna be a specialized video on this. Typically, enemies are gonna just simply walk around the trap and you're gonna also walk around the trap if you can. Where traps kind of come into play is that if you have several of them, let's say, masked up in a line or maybe around a doorway or something like that, it really makes it inhibitive for you to get through the area without triggering it. Something else I'm going to mention, too, is our winged shoes again and the jump icon. So you can go ahead and, let's say, exhaust these shoes during your movement phase. The banner spear can now jump over the trap. If you jump or fly over the trap or if you teleport from one location to the other, you're not typically and you're not physically going over the trap, so it will not trigger. So keep in mind that your winged shoes and jump abilities work well at mitigating trap damage as well. Next, I'm going to talk about hazardous terrain. So as an example, I went ahead and put this sort of lava looking tile onto the board. And notice I also put damage on it as well. Now, the difference between traps and hazardous terrain is that when you pass over a trap, the trap is actually physically removed from the map, but hazardous terrain will remain throughout the course of the mission unless some sort of unusual special effect mitigates it and removes the tile. So as an example, this lava pit is always going to be there. And I went ahead and just put a three on it to denote, you know, as an example, it's going to hit you for three points of damage if you pass through it. So the same rules are going to apply. You can jump over a tile. So as an example, I can jump over this lava slash fire tile and avoid the damage. Same thing with the enemies, this hound, if it passes through this tile, it's going to suffer damage. It's going to suffer damage every single time it goes through that tile. So something else I want to kind of show you is, well, how do you know how much traps and hazardous terrain actually do? So what I did is I went ahead and just grabbed the Frosthaven rulebook. And on the very back panel of the basic rulebook, and I'm going to try to zoom in on this, there's a table and it has scenario level listed. So what we're going to see is that there's a trap damage line on here, and there's also a hazardous terrain um, line on this chart as well. So this is just a reference kind of when you're setting up the map of the mission and you're just going to cross reference what your scenario level is. Typically when you start the game, if you're playing it on normal mode, your scenario level is just going to be one. So a trap's going to do three points of damage and hazardous terrain is going to do two points of damage. All right, so next we're going to talk about pressure plates and there are some specialized tiles in the game. I'm going to try to zoom in on this as best as I can and then place it back on the map. A lot of the scenarios in Gloomhaven and Frosthaven, if you step or end your movement on this, so 
let me actually just rephrase that. You have to be standing on the pressure plate. So something has to stop its movement and end its movement on the pressure plate, then something typically happens and then you reference one of the entries in the in the campaign book. It'll tell you, hey, if if this pressure plate is stepped on, go to blah, 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 and then some sort of effect happens. One of the common things that happens is that it's like linked to a door. So if let's say the banner spear steps on this thing, it'll sometimes unlock or open a door. Uh, that's a, a pretty typical mechanic in Gloomhaven and Frosthaven. So something else that can occur is that anything standing on the pressure plate can cause it to trigger. So maybe you can somehow get the hound to stand on the pressure plate and then some sort of effect occurs. Same case in point though, if, if you do the winged shoes, you're gonna move across the pressure plate, which is kind of irrelevant. You have to stop your movement on the pressure plate for it to actually trigger. Let's have a quick discussion about looting and loot tokens and treasure chests in Gloomhaven slash Frosthaven. As an example on the screen, I now have the Banner Spear. I also have the Blink Blade, which is another basic character in the game. Let's say it's the Banner Spear's turn, and the Banner Spear is very good at eliminating enemies. This Hound has been slain in combat. So what that's going to do is I'm going to replace the slain model, the slain figure, with one of these loot tokens that's going to go onto the map at the exact location that the enemy was defeated. Please note that this is just where an enemy is defeated. Now, what that means is that characters in this game can loot. And the most basic way to loot is you just simply move your character onto a tile, but they have to end their movement on that tile. And at the end of that turn for the round, they're going to just simply take this loot token off the board, and then they're going to go to a corresponding loot deck. Now the loot deck is going to be dependent upon which mission you are actually playing. So at the start of the mission, there's going to be a table in the in the scenario book that's going to tell you what goes into that loot deck. So when you simply pull one of these tiles off the board, you pull just the top card from that deck and you place it near your character. So different types of loot that can appear in the loot deck. Uh, the most simple one is gold. You can gain gold at the end of the mission based upon what your scenario level actually is. So we're gonna to go to the table at the back of the book again, and we have the gold conversion section on the book. So that just means at the end of that mission, you're gonna get two gold for each uh, loot that you pulled from that deck that's actual gold. Other things that you can find are crafting components. So things like wood and steel ore and fur to help you improve your Frosthaven village. So a lot of those crafting resources can be used to build buildings. You can also build craftable items. In addition to that, there are alchemy components and alchemy components can be used for crafting various potions. Next up, I'm gonna show you what's on the map is this is a treasure chest. So kind of the same thing. If the Blink Blade ends their turn on a treasure chest, you can go ahead and remove the treasure chest token from the map. And then typically in the scenario book, it's gonna tell you go to a certain entry and it's gonna tell you what was actually in that treasure chest. Finally, what we're going to talk about, and I'm gonna make things a little bit more interesting by putting numerous loot tokens onto the table is that, okay, so let me just back up a second. If I pass through a space, I don't actually pick up the loot token. Monsters, if they end on a space, typically do not perform looting, although some monsters can loot and remove loot tokens from the map. Monsters aren't going to be looting if they just simply end up on a spot with a loot marker or a treasure chest icon. Next, I'm gonna show you a card right here, and this is a basic card from the Blink Blade. And you're gonna notice in the top panel, there is this symbol. It's two circles with an arrow pointing up, and there's a one next to it. This is going to be a loot ability. So when this thing goes off, the Blink Blade can pick up any treasure or loot anything that's one space away from it. So as an example, I'm gonna take the Banner Spear off the board. If the Blink Blade performs this action, it can pick up this this and it can loot this chest as well. So what makes the game a little bit more versatile is some of the characters do have these loot action cards, so be on the lookout for them. 
And typically they're a one, but you know, you can have some special abilities that probably even go up to a two or even higher. Now, note that that makes kind of positioning your character important at the end of a round. So as an example, let's say the Blink Blade is up here. Maybe they want to come down and then loot these two different um, these two different ones on their turn. So they do a move action, which is the bottom panel. Then they come over here and on the top panel, they're going to go ahead and spend this card. When they perform that loot action, both these come off the table and the player playing the Blink Blade would thus then draw two cards instead of one. You're going to be drawing one per each of these loot tokens you picked off the board. Here's what the loot deck actually looks like. Here's the icon on the back. Notice it's the same symbol that appears on the loot token itself. So when you pull one of these off the table, you just simply draw one of the cards from this deck. And just note that this deck is going to be dependent upon the scenario and it's going to be different every single mission. Next, I'm going to introduce the concept of obstacles. So I put an obstacle onto the table and it's going to be this pile of rocks and debris. Now, what's interesting is we talked earlier about the concept of difficult terrain. So for difficult terrain, it costs two movement to move into a tile with difficult terrain. When it comes to an obstacle, I'm not allowed to move into it at all. So I cannot end my movement on an obstacle ever even if I'm flying or, or if even I'm jumping. Now, I can still use jump to go across the obstacle, okay? But I can never end my movement on it. Same thing with enemies. If an enemy doesn't have flying or jumping, it cannot pass through this at all and it has to go around this obstacle. So something else that we have talked about are a whole host of other different tiles. So I'm gonna go ahead and start placing them back onto the map. So we had our hazardous terrain, and then we also had our trap as well. And then we also have our icy terrain. And we haven't had a chance to really talk about ranged attacks when it comes to all of these different terrain types. So I'm gonna go ahead and just walk you right through that. All of these tiles that I've placed onto the board are not gonna block line of sight. So as an example, we talked about this in a previous video. If my banner spear is going to use this javelin, I can throw it three spaces, but I can only do it if I have line of sight on the enemy. So in this case, none of these tiles are gonna block line of sight. Although they, they can interact with me moving in a negative manner or a different manner, there are gonna be no effects when it comes to throwing or shooting across a tile such as the ones I have displayed on the screen. So something else I'm just gonna to mention too is that your wing shoes and your jump ability really interacts with all of the tiles that I have on the map. So think of it this way, this jump mechanic will work at basically nullifying the effects of any of the different terrain types I have currently on the map. Next, I'm gonna talk about wall tiles. So as an example, I have placed these four wall tiles onto the map. Now wall tiles, I want you to think of these as something that extends from top to bottom in the room. And when you encounter a wall tile, you cannot pass through it at all. So I can't jump through this, nor can I actually see through a wall tile as well. So as an example, I do not have line of sight on the Hound. I could not perform a ranged attack because this is a solid wall coming through this part of the map, just right here. In addition to that, so I can't jump through this. I can't walk through it either. So really the only option I have would be to walk around this. Now later on in the game, we're gonna talk about teleportation. And so we can have a quick discussion on that. But just note that sometimes when you're setting up and it's pretty rare, sometimes you'll find walls in the middle of a room and thus it's something you cannot shoot through, you can't jump through it, nor can you move through it normally. We're gonna close out this video with a discussion of probably the most dangerous mechanic in this game, which is opening a door. It, you know, if you haven't ever played Frosthaven or Gloomhaven, it probably doesn't do it justice, just me telling you that it's dangerous. You, it's something that you're gonna to have to experience on your own, but your characters can suffer a major amount of damage they can even be killed pretty easily when they open a door. And the reason behind it is that you don't necessarily know what's in the next room. And when you open a door, all monsters on that given turn get to attack and move and act even if their initiative marker has passed. All right, so we're gonna go through a basic example of a turnaround 
with our three sort of characters that are on the board. We have a hound, we have the bone shaper, and we have the banner spear. The bone shaper is a green, is the green character on the table. It's one of the basic characters that starts in the game. We also have a door which is closed. I'm gonna go ahead and just zoom in on that. Notice that the door is physically closed. All you have to do is flip it over and then the door is open. So that's how you can tell the difference between an open and closed door. So the characters are going to start in this left-hand room, but they don't actually know what's in the right-hand room until the door opens. It could be monsters, it could be empty, there could be treasure or traps or a whole host of other things that appear in the next room. That's what kind of makes the game fun and exciting. You don't know what's in there until you open the door. So on our turn round, we're just going to go through it. We have Hound, Bone Shaper, and Banner Spear. So we're going to just say that the Hound does its turn. It's going to perform some sort of attack. It, it hits the Bone Shaper for a few points of damage. Next is the Bone Shaper's turn. It performs an attack action, eliminates the Hound. When it eliminates the Hound, a treasure icon pops onto the map. So in this case, now the Bone Shaper still has a move action, which is the bottom part of the card. Moves and goes one, two spaces. When it ends up on this space, we flip the door token over. And as a result of that, then we show what happens in the next room. And what happens in the next room is that a hound spawns in these two different locations. The bone shaper is now out of movement. So since it's the end of the bone shaper's turn, we go back to the initiative tracker and now we see, uh-oh, there's two hounds on the board and their initiative was before the Bone Shaper, which means that they immediately attack after the Bone Shaper's turn. So these two new hounds that were placed onto the map can attack the same round that they are revealed. That's what, what makes opening doors so deadly. Now, as an example, let's say I have a bunch of ranged units in this corresponding room. Imagine they're now performing ranged attacks and their focus is gonna be the Bone Shaper. So the Bone Shaper can take a horrendous amount of damage simply by opening the door. So in this example, now this new hound and this other hound get to attack immediately. So I'm just gonna say that they do their attack. Maybe each one does two to three points of damage to the Bone Shaper. Next up, we're gonna go back to the initiative tracker and it's the Banner Spear's turn. When the Banner Spear gets to go, here's kind of the issue. Now we have sort of a roadblock at the front of the room and the Banner Spear can't really get into melee range. Uh, maybe the Banner Spear ends here so they can perform a loot action and just go ahead and just take that loot token off the board itself. So be extremely skeptical and extremely prepared when you do open a door because all of the monsters on the other side of the door do get to act the same turn that the door is opened. So at this point in the video, I'm gonna throw out some terms that we probably haven't talked about and I'm gonna go over them in subsequent videos, but it really comes down to how prepared are the characters to open the door to the next room. So something that we understand pretty readily is that we have a hit point dial that's in the game. It's just one of these hit point tracker dials. And obviously what I just showed you in the last video segment is that when you open a door, you can suffer a massive amount of damage when going into the next room. So always try to maximize the number of hit points that you have when somebody does open the door and the person entering the room, if they have any sort of defensive abilities, and we talked about um, this one before, anything with a shielding, sort of thing or a counterattack, um, a retaliate sort of special ability. These are great things to have characters on them when they move into the next room. But in this case, we wanna make sure we're maximizing a couple things. One is our hand size. So as I said before, when we're playing the banner spear, we can have a total of, of 10 cards. But, and I'll go through this a little bit later, if we only, let's say, have two cards left to spend before we go into a rest action, that might be a difficult time to open the door. So if I have low hit points and I don't really have too many cards left in my hand to play, that's probably a really bad time to open the door. So I'm gonna go through long resting and short resting in a subsequent video. But for now, we're just gonna focus on be as strong as you can when you do actually open this door. So as an example, maybe what we do is we know that the Banner Spear and the Bone Shaper both have a pretty high hit point total and they have a decent number of cards in their hand. This is a great time to open the door. 
And something that I would also recommend is that you do a low initiative order for that turn. So we don't really know what's in the next room, so I'm going to take the Hound Marker off. But if the Banner Spear and the Bone Shaper both use some cards with some low initiative scores, that might be a good way to avoid a heavy amount of damage. So let's kind of walk you through what that means. So let's say I have a 15 and, and maybe a 20 then for the uh, Bone Shaper. So 15 on the Banner Spear, and then the Bone Shaper has a 20. When the door opens, we're going to have to draw one of those cards from, from the actual deck itself. So in this case, it's a 7 which means that the Hound's gonna go immediately after the Banner Spear. So in this example, um, the room then has three Hounds in here. Now what you're gonna worry about is positioning. If you just run into the room, you have a chance for the Banner Spear to be completely surrounded and attacked. Now there's other things that you can do. Maybe you can put the Banner Spear in the doorway. If you do that, then the biggest number of hounds that can attack the Banner Spear are two. Now there's also a third option. You move onto the space, the door opens, and then you can move back a space. And in this case, we can only have one hound coming into the room, and it's gonna be really stuck where the doorway is, meaning that only one of those hounds can attack you on a given round. What that means is that it might be attacking the Bone Shaper, or, or it might be attacking the Banner Spear, but just by doing some basic positioning, you can change it from your character being attacked three times, your character being attacked two times, or your character being attacked one time from the enemies that are coming through. That's where a lot of the strategy in this game really shines, is building these sort of tactical, really awesome strategic decisions that save your life. So think about basic positioning when you open a door. Let's go through this scenario just a little bit differently. And I know in this game, hounds don't have a ranged attack, but for simplicity, we're just gonna say that all three of these hounds have a ranged attack of four, which means that they can attack four spaces away with a ranged weapon. If I were to open the door and let's say park the banner spear in the doorway, that would be probably not the best thing to do. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clog this doorway. It's gonna make it hard for other characters to move in and out. The other thing too is that all of the hounds are then gonna focus their ranged attack fire on the person in the doorway. So in this case, the banner spear, if the hounds have a ranged attack, would be taking a massive amount of damage. So something that you can do when a room is filled with a pretty hefty amount of ranged attack minions, is you can do stuff like move behind the wall. What that means is that now they don't have line of sight on you and they can't actually snipe at you, which means they have to move first before they can start performing ranged attack actions. So what that does is it forces them toward the doorway. Um, and in some cases, by, what you might want to do is you know really position your characters in something like this and force them to come into the room. And then what that allows you to do is charge them and kill them. So ranged attack opening the door is much different than melee attack opening the door. So depending on what happens, you can either charge them in the next room. So let's say they're like close, close to the door. That would be a good you know, reason for you to charge in here. Uh, remember too that ranged attacker is going to suffer disadvantage if they're at point blank range. Um, now, obviously, they're going to try to maximize that range by moving back before attacking you, but it allows you to then charge into the room and maybe pick off some of these ranged attackers before they can really snipe you. Also, to take into account line of sight issues from after you do open the door. Now, remember, when you open a door, that doesn't mean that you lose your movement. You still get whatever movement you have left on that move action. So, you know, maybe it's one, two, or sometimes there's move actions with four. So you could go one, two, three, four, back yourself into this corner down here and really make sure that the hounds don't have line of sight on you. So think of it as, do you want the enemies to charge you in the room that you're in or do you want to charge the enemies? And some of the maps and scenarios, it kind of forces you into charging through into the next room because it's kind of time dependent. You're slowly running out of cards. So keep that in mind when you open any door. So next I wanna summarize this video, and this is why Frosthaven is such a great game. 
So we introduced all of the different types of terrain that you can interact with over the course of the game. So this is going to add a lot of depth to the tactics that you're gonna be performing on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. That makes the game really exciting. In addition to that, we went over basic mechanics and basic strategies when you open the door. So when you open the door, that could be a very, very dangerous situation for whoever is doing it, and it could lead to a lot of damage being dealt to that character, and in some cases, even, even death. You take such a colossal amount of damage that you have to remove your character from the board and they become exhausted and thus can't act in the rest of the mission. So hopefully you've learned the basics of movement and opening doors. So in the next video, what I'm going to do is start going over all of the status effects. So first I wanted you to understand how to do basic movements and basic attacks and to interact with really the game world that you're in. And next, what we're gonna do is step it up and really go into the intricate strategies that are associated with all of the different status effects. So all of the stuff on the board in conjunction with the status effects makes Frosthaven a really awesome game tactically. It also makes it very, very difficult. So that's why I'm gonna walk you through each of the effects in the next video. I wanna thank you all for joining me today. And as always, have fun gaming.